right. They just made some symbol at me with their hands. I'm going to interpret that as we're ready. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kyle McDonald. I'm going to be closing us out today. Uh, so I'm going to keep it really easy. Don't have to use your laptops. Just sit back, relax. <laughs> it's going to be easy. Not as exciting as jeans, but hopefully there will be something that you can catch on to that's exciting for you. Um, I'm an artist. I'm based in Los Angeles, and I studied computer science, uh, philosophy, and art, and music, and I make a lot of interactive artwork. But I want to know who you are, so I'm going to ask a few questions. Please raise your hand if you're a student. Bunch of students. Okay, please raise your hand if you're interested in architecture. You're working as an architect or you're studying architecture? Yeah. Okay. How about art? Anybody interested in art? Great. How about design? Or you're a designer, maybe. Okay. Who's interested in music? Yeah, my people. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've written one line of code at some point. Yes, excellent. Raise your hand if you went to Gene Kogan's workshop. Oh, it's actually less than I thought. All right, that now, now I feel better about myself. <laughs> uh, please raise your hand if you've seen any of my artwork. Okay, great. So I get to share some things that are new for most people. That's good. What is this talk about? I'm going to talk a little bit about my work that's not related to machine learning, but it's the rest of the talk's very machine learning heavy. I'm going to give kind of an introduction to my perspective on machine learning and uh, then dive into some kind of specific intersections between like ML and drawing, faces and sound and dance. Um, I think actually two of those are out of order, but we'll get to that. I'm going to intersperse a few challenges throughout, uh, some kind of questions for you to think about maybe today, maybe tomorrow, talk to your friends. Um, things that have been helpful for me when I'm thinking about what kind of artwork I want to make or where the future is going. For my work, uh, it kind of spans uh, a lot of different media and scales. Um, here's one example. This is called Social Soul. It's an immersive installation that tries to create a feeling of being inside someone else's mind. I made this with Lauren McCarthy, who's also showing work here with the 24-hour host. How many people went to 24-hour host? Yeah, a few people. Nice. It, was it weird? Yeah? <laughs> Good. That's what she's going for. <laughs> um, so we wanted to explore like this feeling of being overwhelmed by the digital world. Uh, first, the visitor types their Twitter username, and then the installation shows all their text messages and images pulled from Twitter or Instagram um, with text-to-speech bringing all of their words to life. And this content that was pulled from Twitter or Instagram uh, is used to pair the person with someone else who had previously walked through the installation. Um, so the installation kind of uh, sends a tweet to both of you to let you know that you've been paired up and it says this is your social soulmate. You know, you have the same content online. Uh, it's pretty representative of one kind of work that I do. It's a big space filled with lots of technology, creates some kind of strong impression through multiplicity and kind of organized chaos. In 2012, I created this piece, Missing that has some similar qualities. It's a room of uh, 50 speakers that follow you as you walk through the space and plays a spatialized version of the song uh, Missing by the XX, who we worked with on this project. We wanted to create something kind of eerie and exciting and play with this contrast between feelings of kind of warmth and familiarity versus like coldness and robotic movement. In my other immersive work, technology is really hidden from view and light leaks with uh, Jonas Yongyan in 2013, we projected onto disco balls, 50 disco balls, and we mapped every single reflection of light all around the space. Um, this allows us to control the reflections like a big LED display. We're using three projectors here, and the projectors aren't projecting onto the walls, they're projecting onto the disco balls, and then those reflect off, and we control all those reflections. Um, the technology in this case is this kind of complex process of calibration that happens before anybody gets there. Um, but once it's finished, it appears like this magical coincidence. Uh, you might have seen this project from me in 2011 um, called Face Substitution. Uh, not going to talk about this specifically, but I wanted to give this a, as an example to say that computers, I think, have been changing the way we look at ourselves um, by kind of processing and collecting information about us and 
representing this information using computer vision or machine learning or different kinds of network technologies. And I think maybe in all of this data and all these algorithms, we can find a new version of ourselves, something that looks more like the person that we want to become. And that's going to be kind of the theme running throughout what I talk about today. Um, all right, with that in mind, I'm going to... I'm going to uh, talk about some work that combines art and research. And I'll give a little introduction to the terms I'm using. Um, you've probably seen these. AI means artificial intelligence. ML means machine learning. Um, they're both really popular topics. Uh, I want to clarify machine learning is one approach to creating artificial intelligence, which is a much bigger kind of goal. Machine learning is uh, in contrast to some other kinds of um, systems that people, uh, approaches that people have tried historically to create artificial intelligence. Machine learning is, um, even has a smaller subset called deep learning, which Gene was talking about using neural networks that's been really popular recently, and most of the examples I give using ML are going to be using deep learning. Um, but I said here for a second at the top, artificial intelligence, what do you mean by intelligence, Kyle? How do you define intelligence? It's not so clear what it means, right? Uh, maybe you think of intelligence like IQ, intelligence quotient, uh, where some people have more, but most people are average, and some people are really dumb over here. This is a, <laughs> this is a slide from SoftBank, the Japanese company that uh, makes phones and some other things. Um, it turns out that they're also like laundering money for the Saudis into Silicon Valley. Found this out recently, it's very complicated. Um, but uh, they have a very interesting deck that they give out to their shareholders um, where they show what their plan is for the next 100 years. And this was part of their plan for the next 100 years. They're talking about what intelligence means and maybe where artificial intelligence is. They say artificial intelligence is way smarter than any of us. If we're like around 100 and there's some smart humans, AI is like 10,000. I, I think this is really naive. This is, <laughs> this is a kind of simplistic view of intelligence that doesn't really mirror how I feel and think about it, and I think how most people think about intelligence. I like this quote from Edgar Degas, the um, artist who, in 1909, he wrote, uh, the day when people began to write intelligence with a capital I, all was lost. There's no such thing as capital I intelligence. One has lowercase i intelligence for doing this or that. One must have intelligence only for what one is doing. So I tried to kind of list out what some of these different kinds of intelligence can be, in humans at least, so with what we're familiar from our everyday life and hanging out with each other. I think it can mean things like constructing explanations or remembering things, answering questions, making predictions, being creative, um, imitation. Uh, this is to say that intelligence isn't just one of these things, and it's not all of these things together, but I would say that each of these things is one aspect or kind of intelligent behavior. Um, we have also an oversimplified idea of where intelligence comes from, I think. Uh, so if what intelligence is, we've oversimplified it by saying it's IQ. Where intelligence is, we go, oh yeah, it's right here. It's in our big brains. Um, but this is a very interesting MRI scan I found <laughs> from a French civil service worker. It turned out he had his head almost completely filled with uh, cerebrospinal fluid. His head was empty. His brain was empty. There was just a little bit of brain along the corner of his skull. But he didn't know anything was wrong until he visited the doctor one day because his leg had some pains. Um, I think we underestimate like where intelligence is. I don't think it's just in our brain. I think it's not only throughout our body, but in our relationships with each other. And we also like embed it in the world around us. We have a lot of embodied intelligence. I'd say we also have an oversimplified idea of who is responsible for our intelligence. So let's listen for a moment to this recording of an automated phone call. Hi, I'm good. How are you? Well, I'm calling about an online request you once made about health insurance coverage. Okay. I work with all major companies and compare... Hey, are you a robot? <laughs> what? No, I am a real person. Maybe we have a bad connection. I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's crazy. I see you just sound so much like a robot. I am a real person. Maybe we have a bad connection. I'm sorry about that. Will you tell me you're not a robot? Just say I'm not a robot, please. 
I am a real person. <laughs> I mean, I believe you, but will you just say, I'm not a robot? It'll make me feel better to hear you say it. <laughs> there is a live person here. <laughs> But I know there is. It just make so it keeps it keeps going for like two more minutes. <laughs> it's a really long recording, and it turns out it's true. They are a real person, but instead of speaking for themselves, they're actually pressing buttons that play pre-recorded messages. In a way, there's multiple intelligences represented here. It's a kind of composite system that's stretched over time and space, from the original recording all the way to the interactive playback from the person who is actually on that phone call. So what happens if it goes the other way? What if automation controls the human instead of the human controlling the automation? I looked into this idea of a kind of alternative hybrid system with Matt Metz in 2012 for this project, Blind Self-Portrait. We use the human hand as an extension of an otherwise completely automated system. So when the visitor to this installation closes their eyes, this triggers the machine to start drawing using the visitor's own hand. <laughs> uh, the human intelligence in this system is minimized as much as possible. The human is used in uh, this large, it's just a kind of tool in this larger apparatus. You could say that the machine's making the decisions and the human's just following directions. I think one of our fears of machine intelligence that shows up a lot in popular media is that it will treat us in the worst ways that we treat other people. When you're when you have your hand being moved by this robot, you start to feel like this must be what it's like to be a slave. <laughs> I don't wish this upon anybody. <laughs> so here's a challenge, first challenge. Think of an example of intelligence in something that you wouldn't normally call intelligent. And maybe the corollary is, think of an example of a lack of intelligence in something that you would normally call uh, intelligent. Intelligence can also involve a whole crowd of people. In 2014, I read this book by an experimental French writer, Georges Perec, called An Attempt at Exhausting a Place in Paris. He sat on a bench in Paris for three days in 1974, and he tried to transcribe everything that was happening in exquisite detail, down to like the smallest things. His writing feels like this very human act of observation. It's something that can't be automated at least not yet. For example, he writes, let's see, where are we? Over here, the rain gets fierce. A lady makes a hat with a plastic bag marked Nicholas. Genevieve Soreau passes by in front of the cafe, too far away for me to get her attention. Some green emerges from a shopping bag. The church square is almost empty. Three people cross it. An apple green car. A 96 bus. He really loved riding every single bus. Whenever there was a number on a bus, he was like, oh, that one. Got it. Got it. <laughs> I was just starting to study machine learning when I read this. And uh, one of the lessons in Parekh's book is that it's impossible to avoid categorization. When you're kind of looking out into the world and sharing it with other people, you have to kind of compartmentalize and describe things in these very clear categories in order to communicate it all. Um, we like to imagine that humans are full of subtlety and nuance, but when we're caught in the moment and trying to capture as much as possible, so many things are lost. And what's not lost is significantly simplified. So with all of this in mind, I created this piece called Exhausting a Crowd uh, in 2015 with Jonas Yangyan. Um, he was also my collaborator with, on the Disco Balls project. Um, we recorded 12 hours of footage at Piccadilly Circus in London, and we streamed it online with a tool that allows people to add notes different places in the scene. And there are a few instances where it tends towards kind of outright surveillance. Like here, it says someone wrote, car runs a red light. Um, you can see that it's like a green walk sign, and there's people <laughs> trying to cross the street. Um, and in these moments, you really feel like the website acts like an extension of authority. I think whenever we have access to a kind of all-seeing eye, it feels really natural to become the police. We want to enforce like what feels right to us when we can see everything that's happening. 
Um, most of the time it's kind of surreal and absurd, like I'm actually a black hole sending rubbish to other dimensions where it's properly recycled and reused. Um, I like this idea of like weird objects scattered throughout space that have totally nonsensical purposes. Uh, there's also some <laughs> Funny, <laughs> funny moments, like in the middle of the night, because we shot from 3 p.m. to 3 a.m. So there's these melancholy scenes, like Tony and Guy is written on the outside, and there's only two people riding the bus, Tony and Guy. This is one of my favorite sequences. Uh, it was added really early in the project by a few different people. So each person can add one or two or three notes, but after a couple, People usually, you know, give up and then come back to the website another day, and someone else kind of continues what they started. So I'm going to read uh, read this as it happens. Um, watch this couple at the bottom right. Oh, also, we're zoomed in right now, so the full frame for the website is like four times bigger than this. This was a kind of minor detail in the corner, the same way I was saying, like, Perek was transcribing these really small details about, like, a little bit of green appears from a shopping bag. So he says, and then I says to Mabel, Mabel, wait, look over there. Kiss me, you fool. Gotta be. <laughs> what, right here, right now? Yes, kiss right on the lips. A couple kissing. Oh, how do I get her back to my apartment? Kiss. Do you think anybody's recording us? <laughs> okay, but watch this. It says, can I put this hand lower? Is this okay? I like this. Consent is good. <laughs> Ding. Okay, but watch his hand. If you can see it, hand placed like a gentleman. Oh, hand lower now. This is like the smallest detail in the smallest corner of the video. I n never could have seen this in 12 hours of footage, but somehow when you get you know, thousands of people looking at this website over enough time, they find these details, they're there. There's, there's some kind of humanity in every corner of natural existence. Gotta pee. <laughs> so exhausting a crowd still online, and uh, in 2015 we added an hour at another location. Last year we added an, a couple hours at other, other cities. Um, we keep kind of taking it from place to place and touring it. One big lesson for me is that when you have a lot of data, it takes humans to make a story out of it. You can't just throw it at a computer and expect to have a human understanding. You need a human to have a human understanding. There's some data that only humans can make decisions about right now, but I don't know if it's going to be that way forever. Like, if you look at what you should be doing when uh, you're about to hit someone driving a car. If you're a computer, um, there's this question of like the trolley problem. Like what should a computer do if it's driving a car? Should it try and save the passengers or should it try and save the pedestrians? And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of philosophers and kind of pop scientists that have opinions on this, but the best um, explanation I've heard for what the problem with the trolley problem is is that we'll never have a good answer because a computer can never experience the horror of making a decision about who should live and who should die. And I think that's true for a lot of the most serious problems that we're using machine learning to answer. Um, okay, back to this kind of general understanding of what ML is. Uh, I'm not gonna have any equations like Gene had. I'm gonna try and keep it a little simpler. And the way I like to wrap up what machine learning is, and this isn't 100% accurate, this is like 80% accurate. I like to think of it as programming with examples instead of instructions. Normally, when you program, you write code and you give instructions of what to do in order. I think with machine learning, you give examples of what to do, and they're not always in order. Let's look at some examples of what machine learning can accomplish right now. Uh, in 2012, there's a big breakthrough, and it powers a lot of what happens with images using machine learning right now. Um, this was the first time where uh, computers were able to kind of usefully detect what the content of an image was, what object was in an image. If you have an example, uh, if sorry, let me go back. The only reason this is possible is because a researcher named Fei Fei Liu collected a huge database with her grad students of photos paired with captions. And in this case, the captions are um, like single object categories, like leopard or motor scooter or cherry. 
if you get a data set that has pairing of images with captions that are longer explanations, like uh, two hockey players are fighting over the puck, then you can train an ML algorithm to do that same kind of imitation or prediction. I want to give a quick demo of what this looks like for these algorithms to run in real time. All right, let's switch over here. All right. So sometimes it's hard from when someone's just explaining, like, here's the research, here's some pictures of the research. Gene does a really good job of showing a lot of demos. Um, I don't have as many, but I wanted to share a couple so that if you haven't seen what this looks like running in real time, you get a feeling for it. So this is a model I trained to recognize facial expressions, which we'll get back to again later. Um, and it's running right now on me, <laughs> trying to make an estimate of how happy I am or Surprised? I guess surprise looks a little bit like fear. <laughs> or sad. Anger. Disgust. Ah, uh, disgust is hard. Hold on. I just got to wiggle a little. Okay, fear. <laughs> yes. Okay, and here we go. <sighs> Contempt is almost impossible. Oh, did you see a move? <laughs> ah, I got a little bit. <laughs> I think it, normally these algorithms run kind of behind the scenes. We don't really see what's happening. We see just that Facebook tagged us in an image automatically, or um, you know that Twitter thinks that we're happy, in, or like our camera thinks we're happy in one image but not in another. Um, but when you see it running in real time, you have a really different feeling. It's like the computer is kind of judging you. <laughs> you have a feeling a little bit more like you're sort of um, looking at someone else's face in a way. Like these sliders, to me, as I'm watching them, it feels like talking to someone and watching their expression in real time as they're reacting to how I present myself. And I think it's um, important for us to kind of build up an intuition for these things about like what the computer's really doing. Um, if it's always happening behind the scenes, uh, it can be hard to have that same intuition. Uh, like when you see an expression analysis happening like this, it doesn't feel too scary. It's like, okay, it's a little awkward. It feels like uh, it's trying to be more human than it actually is. That's kind of strange. But when you start going through all the different categories that you might consider, like all the things that you could imagine training one of these algorithms to do based on the data that's available, um, it starts to really feel like it's judging you in a very different way. You know, like, wh am I? I guess I, maybe I'm a little chubby. Okay. <laughs> maybe if I can, like... <laughs> um, sideburns, no sideburns today. Partially obstructed, bushy eyebrows, that's definitely true. <laughs> no, not, not big enough lips. Mouth closed, mouth open. I think the light's not quite right for that. Teeth not visible. That one's good. Yeah, so it just keeps going. And uh, some of these are more uncomfortable than others, right? Like, I don't really care whether it thinks I'm wearing sunglasses or not, but whether it thinks I'm Indian or not, that could have a big bearing on what the algorithm's being used for. Um, so we're going to get back to some more of that face stuff in a minute, but I just wanted to give you a feeling of like what that looks like when it's running in real time. All right. Uh, it doesn't have to be photos that machine learning is working with. Neural nets, deep learning, the specific subset of machine learning, can work with almost any kind of media. I'm going to play a recording of something called Duplex from Google that's currently in development. It's designed to call shops and restaurants and ask for hours and schedule appointments, place orders on your behalf. Uh, it's designed to sound like a human. Where can I help you? Hello? Hello, what's up, man? Hey, um, I wanted to know what are your hours for today? 
10 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. Okay, got it. Thank you for your time. No problem, sir. Bye. So unlike Samantha, which we heard earlier, it's not using any pre-recorded messages. There's no one pressing buttons. Um, if you have a big enough collection of example phone calls, neural nets can predict phone call conversations. Um, and it turns out this is probably why Google was giving away free no phone numbers to everyone for the last 10 years. Uh, they can also, neural nets can also imitate speech from a specific person. Neural nets can also imitate speech from a specific person. This, this is an, an example, example from, from a company, company called, called Lyrebird, Lyrebird spoken, spoken using, using my voice. voice. <laughs> I would say, in general, they, these machine learning systems excel at imitation. And uh, Gene showed some really good examples of this. this and this is uh, some research from 2015 um, called a neural algorithm of artistic style, where they showed that uh, they could take a kind of um, uh, reference image for how a photo should look and generate the f photo in the style of the reference image. So in this case, um, the photos on the left, this is uh, Tübingen in Germany, and then Reference image is like Starry Night from Van Gogh, or um, you've got Kandinsky or Picasso. Or when you run it through this algorithm, uh, algorithm artistic style, you get this kind of stylized image back that has the content of the photo and then the style of the uh, reference image. And it seems like this is something that is it should be impossible. Like there's art students that study for years to try and do this kind of thing and the computer just did this in five minutes right like that shouldn't be the way that kind of creativity works um, but it happens very naturally it doesn't seem to have a problem once you figure out the math behind it um, st imitating style can be m much more complicated to it it's not necessarily like finding the right textures sometimes if you want to say you know I want this sketch to look more like a photo or this photo to look more like a sketch that's not just about finding the right textures that's about really understanding things like lighting and comp uh, you know what it means for a human to have teeth like if you look at the sketch on the left you can see that uh, teeth look one way and the photo on the right the teeth actually look like they were copied directly from the other photo um, there's some high-level things that the, these automated systems don't completely understand, um, but there's not really any good reason to think that they're not going to keep getting closer and closer to what we want them to do, closer and closer to imitating the way we see like a successful version of this. With enough examples of short videos, and remember, this is just imitation. It's like programming by example, right? So you just have to have enough examples of anything, pretty much, at this point. Um, with enough short videos divided into categories, then neural nets can imitate these videos. This is generating videos with scene dynamics from 2016. I love these babies on the bottom right, because I can't imagine having a baby that looks like that. <laughs> um, so here's the next challenge. Uh, for me, um, this is something that keeps coming to me when I look at these examples of like generating uh, text or generating speech that uh, or music or f images that are really artistically or creatively compelling somehow. Um, think of a creative artifact, name a creative artifact where human authorship is not essential for your appreciation. Um, for me, like a good, an example is a good meal. Like it doesn't really matter if it was a human chef or a robot chef. I'm going to enjoy it the same. Um, or some kinds of design and music that are meant to be more decorative. It doesn't necessarily matter if there's a human behind it. If it makes the space feel comfortable or if it makes like the airport feel relaxed. Um, sorry, Brian Eno. <laughs> um, it's fine if there is no human behind it. But there's also the opposite, right? What, what's something that requires a human? Uh, some creative artifact that requires a human for you to care about it. And maybe an example would be like a very personal story, like some non nonfiction or poetry that is very, like coming from some kind of personal expression or a really heartfelt song. I don't think it would mean the same thing to me if I knew it was made by a computer that was just learning from kind of human artifacts or human creativity. Instead of representing some personal expression, it would be more like a remix or a distillation of human culture, and that would mean something really different to me. 
so I'd say all those examples were pretty creative in some sense, uh, that they capture some notion of like remixing what's around you or uh, pr producing something that inspires like new ideas and the people who see it. But I think we can go even further in that direction. Like machine learning is normally used for stuff like spam filters or music recommendation, uh, picking which advertisements you should see or doing face recognition. Um, so I think we can keep pushing further in this creative direction. I want to give a couple examples of that. Um, turns out the same thing that makes machine learning good at imitation also allows it to be really good at understanding similarity. And this can help us find connections in really disconnected data. Terra Pattern is an open source tool I helped build uh, in 2015, or sorry, 2016, which offers similar image search for satellite imagery to help people find patterns of interest and democratize geospatial intelligence. So it's really perfect for locating infrastructure that's not usually indicated on maps, things that haven't been mapped. So when you click on one container yard, it pulls up other container yards, or one cul-de-sac, it pulls up other cul-de-sacs, sand traps, power lines, tennis courts. Uh, let's see, what are we looking for here? Maybe some boats, or uh, like weird pier, circular pier-shaped things. Um, I also use Search by Similarity for this piece called Sharing Faces to help friends find a connection across borders. We installed the same piece between Japan and South Korea, and when you explore this installation with your face, it automatically s finds someone with a similar expression from the other country. I think this direction of machine learning in the context of relationships, like across countries, is equally exciting and scary to like, you know, what what is face recognition or advertisement rec um, recommendations, music recommendations, what do all those look like in our daily life? Um, I think what does machine learning mean for relationships is just as exciting. The, the philosopher Pierre Levy says, uh, what remains after we have mechanized agriculture, industry, and uh, messaging technologies. The economy will center on that which can never be fully automated, on that which is irreducible, the production of the social bond, the relational. Um, so if you saw Lauren's work here, you'll know that she's really interested in these kind of relational, um, relational <laughs> manipulation and uh, like what computers do to our relationships. Um, We've been working on our projects together, actually, since we met. Um, and I want to share a couple of pieces with Lauren that kind of fit this theme from Levy about uh, using machine learning to automate the unautomatable. <laughs> this is a project called Us Plus from 2013. Hi, Claire. How's hey, school Mom. treating you? Um, I'm doing OK right now. I'm just kind of annoyed because there's this girl named Stacy in my yoga class who just got pregnant and she won't stop talking about it. And I just feel like she's being really Technology has made us more connected than ever. Shouldn't it help us get more from each other? She just won't stop talking about her pregnancy and what yoga moves that the whole class should not do because she can't. Us Plus gives suggestions based on speech analysis and facial expressions. Right now, it's just everything. Everything is... Um, how are you doing, Mom? Well, actually, things haven't been all that great. I wasn't sure whether to tell you this, but, um... More honesty, more balance. I feel like we're barely communicating, and sometimes it's just... It's just not the same. Uh, I try to talk to you and you don't respond, and I can't even... <laughs> I love you. It's been so long since you said that. <laughs> More connection. It's looking pretty bleak. And our profit margins fell last quarter. But I think we can turn things around. If we outsource step four, we should be okay. We could also get it down five cents more if we use cheaper materials in steps 19 and 23, and the public will never know. I like how you think. <laughs> more productivity, more success. Get more out of your conversations. Us Plus. So this was a real app that we made. 
it actually worked. Like you could start it inside Google Hangouts and just <laughs> like start getting feedback immediately about how to have a better conversation with your mom or your boyfriend. And um, it was really awkward. <laughs> uh, Lauren used it once with a journalist who was doing an interview to ask us about this project. And um, the journalist was like, okay, well, I get that this is, uh, you know, analyzing my facial expressions and listening to my voice, but does the whole system really work? And then a little notification popped up on her screen that said, on the journalist's screen that said, don't be so skeptical. <laughs> Another example is called People Keeper from 2014. Uh, we created this app that uses a heart rate monitor to track how different friends affect your mood and automatically optimize your social life. Emotional bandwidth. Oh, sorry. We only have so much emotional bandwidth. Bring it in. And limited time. What's the best of all? Our social circles are widening. We don't know that's bad. But all those relationships. Anything so like <laughs> in general that makes you excited. It just can be overwhelming. So now there's an app. People Keeper tracks your physical and emotional response while you're hanging out, and it analyzes the data to identify who stresses you out, and makes you excited, sad, or happy. See how your relationships stack up, and let People Keeper find the ones that work for you. It'll automatically manage your relationships, so you don't have to. Scheduling time with people that make you feel good and blocking the ones that don't. Forget fake friends, failed romance, and FOMO. Optimize your social <laughs> life with PeopleKeeper. So again, this, is, this was a real app. You could actually download this. It, um, I think there's some changes in the latest uh, iOS that make it stop working, but for, I don't know, four years or something, it was, it was fine, and a lot of people tried it and had their relationships deleted from their contact list. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think one of our goals in making this kind of artwork is to create a space for reflection on technologies in our everyday life, um, whether they're here now or coming up soon, and how they're affecting our society. Um, I want to create a space for building an intuition for machine intelligence and automation. I think if we don't take the time to reflect as a society, then we'll fall into the same traps as the past. So let's go into a few kind of specific intersections of ML with some different topics. Um, I want to talk about drawing for a sec because uh, I worked on this, I helped with this project called Quick Draw. Um, if you've seen this, uh, you go to the website. This is from Google Creative Lab. Um, it asks you to draw something specific. It's kind of like um, this party game where you have to draw something, but nobody knows what the category is, and the first person to say the name gets a point, except in this case, the computer is guessing. So you're asked to draw a specific category, like remote control, and as you're drawing, the computer throws out all these possibilities, and then when it gets it right, you move on to the next stage, and you get a point. So it's kind of the inversion. Um, once they finished Quick Draw, they asked me to look at some of the data that they collected. It was about a billion drawings from all over the world. And we started uh, kind of collating them and, and uh, processing them and visualizing them in different ways. Um, and Quick Draw was using ML for recognizing the drawings themselves. But I think the most interesting part of this project for me was actually in that collected data set of all the drawings from all over the world. One of the first things we noticed was that some categories have very clear differences between different countries. Like in the US, everyone draws chairs basically from the side. But in Taiwan, everyone draws chairs from perspective, like in 3D. We never really got an explanation for this, but we noticed that it was common in some other countries too. Mainly in East Asia, people are drawing, uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia, people are drawing chairs um, in perspective. Um, sometimes it's clear like why this happens, like you know, in Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea, this is the um, uh, stoplight category, and you can see most of the stoplights are vertical, because in most places stoplights are oriented vertically, but in these East Asian countries, you often see something like this, and that ends up getting reflected into the kind of collective consciousness of how people imagine that category of objects. Um, does anybody know the outlier here? This is the stop sign category. It turns out in Israel, stop signs look like this. 
<laughs> and it's the only country where it doesn't say stop, pretty much. So uh, the reason I wanted to talk about this is because there's this huge mystery I've been wondering about since like a year ago when we started working on this. This is the fish category. Um, in most of the world, no one cares which direction a fish points. There are some outliers in East Asia, right? Like in Japan, everyone draws a fish facing left. And for some reason, in Turkey, <laughs> fishes face right. Does anybody have an explanation for this? It's total outlier. Like it almost gets there, maybe in France or I don't know. So, like France is getting close to resolving right facing fish, but it, I just don't see it. So if you have an explanation, please come up to me afterwards. I feel like this is finally my chance to have this mystery resolved and <laughs> I would be very happy. Um, some other examples like uh, this is the smiley face category and you can see like the eyes are really smiling in Japan and Korea, whereas the rest of the world are kind of circular eyes. Um, yeah, so I was working on, uh, I've been working on these kind of drawing projects with both Google Creative Lab and Google Arts and Culture, who are interested in the intersection of machine learning and kind of cultural artifacts and creativity and um, generally just finding a way to make machine learning not seem scary. <laughs> and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to release one of the projects we were working on um, soon, looking through all of their, uh, all of Google Arts and Culture's data from all around the world, different um, historical artifacts, sculptures and paintings. Um, we're kind of building an interface that uh, uses drawing to search that collection. Okay, another intersection, ML and sound. I think you saw something similar to this from Jean. Welcome. So this is another way of using that search by similarity idea. Like I was saying about uh, uh, machine learning algorithms excelling at imitation, the same thing allows them to excel at simi understanding similarity. Uh, this is really helpful if you've got something that's way bigger than you could ever look at by yourself, like as an individual. I couldn't go through all uh, 20,000 sounds that are right here. Uh, it would take me a while. <laughs> um, but if I've got some idea of like, I'm looking for something similar to something else, then it gives me, a the machine learning gives me a chance to have like a new perspective on the same data. Um, it's kind of like a super, gives me some superpowers. Uh, I've also been working with Google Creative Lab on this uh, synthesizer called Nsynth Super, which where I helped design and prototype uh, the interface and visualization. Um, the idea is that we wanted to use machine learning to kind of interpolate between different sounds. This whole space around what you can do with sound and machine learning is just starting to open up. It wasn't really one of the first things that researchers were working on. They were all really focused on images and text from the beginning. Uh, so <laughs> sounds a little behind, but one of the things I'm most excited about right now in the audio world is some research from Memo Akton, who's a Turkish guy living in London recently. And uh, he's been doing some research on uh, kind of synthesizing new sounds that are coming from multiple sources and blending between them, not in the Ensynth Super kind of way, but in, uh, well, I'll play it for you and maybe you can understand. 
love about this approach is that it helps me have a, a intuition for how alien the machine's understanding of sound is. These intermediate spaces between these two sounds, the way it blends together, it's not at all how I think about like what it means to blend between things. And that gives me a lot of new ideas for what I want to do with sound. All right, another example, ML and dance. Um, Earlier this year, a uh, friend, Daito Manabe from Tokyo, asked if I'd be interested in doing some kind of project about dance and machine learning. And we worked on some dance, uh, interactive dance projects before. With uh, This one was with Klaus Obermeier called Transcranial, where we were kind of segmenting the dancers and like throwing their body parts around. <laughs> um, I've also worked with uh, dancers like Lisa Pada, and uh, I worked with... Uh, Studi <laughs> worked with a cultural organization called YCAM in Japan on a toolkit that's designed for kind of capturing um, dancers' bodies and doing sort of debug visualizations to help dancers understand a kind of shared imagination of um, the kind of virtual space they're dancing in. And for the work for this project, uh, I was working on with Daito and uh, choreographer Mikiko in Tokyo, we were really inspired by um, this project called Ch Core RNN or Chore RNN, uh, where they collected about six hours, I think, of contemporary dance using a Kinect, like 3D sensor, and they trained a model, like a machine learning model, that's really similar to a text generation model. They trained it instead to generate human motion. So these are not like recordings from humans. This is the machine learning algorithm trying to imitate human movement. <clears throat> we were really into this, like, <laughs> uh, the weirdness of this, but we wanted something even weirder, something that felt more unfinished. So we sort of took our own approach. We started collecting our own data. <laughs> We recorded like four hours <laughs> one day just in these motion capture suits in different styles um, using a Vicon motion capture system. Um, different styles like do the robot, dance sad, dance cute, this sort of thing. And they had a kind of beat to keep timing. Um, one of the big technical questions when we were collecting this data is how to represent dance. Like do we, do we use the kind of native format for dance called BVH? file format where there's this kind of skeletal structure with a fixed set of limbs and position rotation offsets for every frame? Or uh, do we use something that's like quaternion rotations or axis angle rotations? All these like really obscure technical questions, but it turned out it made a really big difference for what sort of motion was generated by the system, which representation we chose really affected what the output data looked like. Um, we kind of invented a new network called Dance to Dance with uh, Parag Mittal, who is the researcher working on, uh, focused on that network. Um, and we started to get some output that looked vaguely similar to some of our input data. So on the left, wow, actually I lost track. I was gonna say one of these is, <laughs> oh yes. So on the right, this is like what it's supposed to do. <laughs> And on the left is what it's trying to do. 
So there's a connection here, but you've got to really know the data to understand like why it thinks this one's related to that one at all. Um, and we were we kind of fell in love with like the chaos on the left, and we basically found a way to put it on stage with a real dancer. moment where she kind of goes crazy is one of my favorites because it represents this transformation from the motion capture data through the machine learning system onto the stage and then back into the dancer's body. This is like a huge kind of process that ends in uh, something that might not have ever existed otherwise. Um, we also wanted to have, uh, we wanted to give the audience the chance to have this feeling of like having their um, motion kind of interpreted by the machine and represented. Um, so in the last uh, performance we did of this project called Discrete, Discrete Figures, um, we, were, we developed a new scene uh, based on some research called Everybody Dance Now from just a few months ago, um, where they basically uh, take a reference video and they analyze the um, so they sort of generate motion capture data from the reference video, and they use that as like their training data. So remember earlier I said as long as you have examples of what the output for a given input should be, you can probably train an algorithm to do that for you. That's what they do here is they say, given this input of the skeleton being like this, generate an output of the person that we captured before making that pose. And if you do that frame by frame, then you can generate these videos of people who have no clue how to dance looking like they know how to dance. Um, so we did the same thing. Uh, we, ca we set up a kind of station for capturing people's dances. And we tried to generate some of that. <laughs> but we only had about 15 minutes to train the neural net between capturing the dance and the stage, uh, like the curtains going down on the uh, curtains going up on the stage. Um, so what we decided to do is actually show the process of the neural net kind of learning to generate the video that looked like the people that were captured earlier. And you can see that on the left. Maybe if I skip forward, you can see it gets a little better over time, but it never gets quite to the quality of everybody dance now. OK, last section. I've only got about five minutes left, so I might skip a few things. But I think this part's really important. Um, I mentioned phase substitution. Uh, I've been thinking about faces for a while. Um, <laughs> I just want to show my favorite face substitution example. <laughs> uh, there's been some really like dangerous research with neural nets involving faces over the last few years. Um, it's not new. People have been using faces to make kind of snap judgments about people for a long time. Um, but this paper... Uh, I think got a lot of press called Deep Neural Networks Are More Accurate Than Humans at Detecting Sexual Orientation from Facial Images. Um, this, these researchers showed that they could train a neural net to identify from a photo whether that photo was posted on, um, whether that post photo was posted to, uh, uh, how did they do this? <laughs> they basically, they went to Facebook and they downloaded a bunch of profile photos and they checked to see if those people from those profiles were on groups like LGBT Pride or something like that. And um, if they were, they assumed that that person was not straight. And they divided everybody up into these two categories, straight and not straight. And uh, finally, they trained a model to predict from the photo which category the person belonged in. Um, and what you can kind of see here is they've got this like two by two grid. So there's straight and gay men and straight and gay women. And uh, they are basically like reinforcing kind of cultural biases about like how, <laughs> what, it, what it means to look straight, what it means to look gay. Uh, I don't think that this is like, 
I don't think like we want to be. I don't. Th I don't think judging each other by the way we look is like a good feature of human culture. I think it's something we do very naturally, but it's not something that um, I want to teach a machine how to do. And it kind of scares me that they're doing this. Um, it doesn't. It. I mean. <laughs> in some ways, like sexuality is like actually not even the worst thing that you could predict. This one's called uh, automated inference on criminality using face images from uh, a couple of years ago. They were trying to predict from a photo of a face whether someone is a criminal or not, which seems like, okay, <laughs> that's even more misguided. I don't know how there could even be a relationship there. It's actually, uh, some, there's some really disturbing things in this specific image. Like um, you can see, Okay, they say the four types of criminal faces on the top and the three types, uh, subtypes of non-criminal faces on the bottom. Um, just looking at this really quickly, you can see that like the four non, or sorry, the four, uh, the four criminal faces on the top, they all have like a white background and the ones on the bottom all have like a gray background. I wouldn't be surprised if they took like mug shots for the top one and then like corporate website images for the bottom one, which would mean like basically depending on how dark your background is that determines whether you're a criminal or not. <laughs> Doesn't seem like a very good classifier. <laughs> it's, this is, none of this is new. Again, you could go back to like the 1600s to talk about like how faces are connected to the judgments we make about each other. But even in the context of machine learning, you have projects like Photo Feeler from 2013 where you upload your uh, profile picture to a website and it tells you how confident or authentic or fun your profile picture looks. Or you have Deep Looks from Party, which is kind of like an experimental advertising agency from 2016. You upload your photo and it tells you how attractive you are. So I had to try this. <laughs> I put my photo in there, I kind of get the eyes right. It tells you it's calculating the score and then I got a very good score. Okay, I have to be honest. Actually, the first one I tried, I got a very bad score. <laughs> I had to go through a lot of photos before I got a good one. Um, <laughs> uh, this isn't something that happened in 2016 and then people forgot about it. Uh, just this year, there was this paper called a diverse benchmark data set for multi-paradigm facial beauty prediction. This, this paper is wild because one of the things that they're emphasizing as being um, like a contribution of their paper is basically <laughs> that it's diverse. They say like, okay, there was some research before about predicting whether someone's beautiful or not, but it only really used East Asian faces. So we're gonna make it better and have a bigger data set. And within like the scientist's mind, this all makes sense. It's like, oh yeah, the model wasn't very good before. We can make it better. But like if you take just a little bit of a step back, you're like, wait, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing in the first place? Like it doesn't matter if it works for one person and not another. Like why are we predicting whether people are beautiful with computers at all? Um, Again, it's not new. We've been trying to categorize people based on the way they look for all of history, and it's always led us farther apart from each other rather than bringing us together. Um, so this is the next challenge, one of the last two. Uh, name, name a feature of humanity that would be terrible to automate. <laughs> Uh, maybe for me, the first thing that comes to mind is making assumptions about people based on the way they look. I don't want computers doing that. I don't want humans doing that either. Um, maybe there, there's a corollary to this too. Like name a feature of humanity that would be incredible to automate. Um, I think being open to change in ourselves, being open to other people changing, I'd like to see computers be able to do that. Maybe being able to put other people before ourselves. It would be cool if you know a computational intelligence had some motivation to like not <laughs> worry about itself as much as I don't even know how that would work, but um, like I think that w we're building systems that replicate some of the worst things that humans do. Um, you might look at like the things like beauty or like whether someone's a criminal and say, oh yeah, well those categories just aren't very clear cut, you know? Like you can't, either you can't really tell from someone's face whether they're beautiful or not or criminal or not. Um, but some things are obvious, right? Like facial expressions. We pretty much agree all around the world, like happiness, fear, anger, sadness. I wanna show you an example, just one of my favorite examples of how complicated facial expressions are. <laughs> this is from a Japanese TV show. They're trying to make each other laugh. <laughs> 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 
っぽいけどね。まあまあでももうね、これもね、皆さんの、皆さんで、刺激したね、気をつけて、コロボちゃん、気をつけてよ、皆さん、これで終わりじゃないからね、仕掛けてくるよ、来ますよ、コロッケさん、これで終わりじゃないよ、すごいのあったから、頑張って、頑張っといて、頑張っといて、来るよ、じゃあ、あーやばい、来た、はい、そう、どうなった。<laughs> What do you even call that? What is the name for that facial expression? That is not anger. That's not fear. That's not happiness. It doesn't fit in any of those categories. And even when you look at these data sets where you're like, okay, I'm just going to at least take a stab at it. I'm going to try and train a model. To predict what someone's facial expression is, let's find the data that's available. I looked through these and I tried to train my own model, and I started to notice that even these data sets have terrible problems. Like, these are real examples from the same、uh, data sets that like, Google or Facebook is using to train their machine learning models.、Um, <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> I feel like recognizing facial expressions isn't as dangerous as some other things, like recognizing which country someone's from, right? I've been, basically, I've been doing this for the last year. I've been looking through a lot of these public data sets and trying to understand what are the limitations of the data sets and the models. What kind of trade offs do these researchers need to make that they don't necessarily tell us in the papers that they're writing?、Um, this was a data set called Who Goes There, which is、uh, scraped from Flickr. So,、uh, millions of faces, like literally a million faces, taken from Flickr from all over the world. They're trying to do something, they're trying to overcome these problems of bias, right? They're like, everyone's taking photos, we're going to use everyone's photos, we're going to make sure it's really well distributed, we're not going to be just like, you know, white people in Scandinavia, or like, <laughs> we're going to try and cover everything.、Um, we're not just going to be like East Asian beauty prediction,、uh, like the other paper. We're going to do everything, everybody. No more bias, we've solved it. So I started looking at some of these averages and training a neural net to predict from a face where is someone from. And to make sure that the model was working, oh, and this was like kind of, I think, 20,、uh, 20 sub regions around the world, like、um, very general sub regions like、uh, South Africa, West Africa,、um, Oceania. Southeast Asia, this sort of thing.、Um, after I trained the model to identify where someone was from using their face, I told it to go back through the data and show me which faces were most representative of that category. Like, who is the most West African looking person in the data set or West African looking people? Because I wanted to understand, like, what sort of,、um, like, yeah, like, what was the model's bias about who belonged where? This is what it told me for Central Africa. This is, this is the top, I forget, like 200 results for the person or the people who look most Central African. And、um, I don't know if you've looked at many, people,、uh, many photos of people from Central Africa, but generally they don't look like this guy. And、uh, I had to dig through the data bit, a bit to find out why this was coming back as the top result. Because It, the model was pretty good. Like, the results were good. The accuracy was very high. And it felt really counterintuitive to me. Like, why would this guy be at the top when the accuracy was high? And it turns out this guy was basically just backpacking around Central Africa. And、uh, he took a photo of himself in every city that he went to and uploaded it to Flickr. <laughs> so, if you try and train a model on that data, then you're going to discover that this person's very representative of every city in Central Africa. If you do this again in East Asia, can you guess who the most East Asian looking person is? Well, it's the Buddha, because everyone takes photos of the Buddha. All right, you should get this one. Who's the most Middle Eastern looking person? They're actually here in this city. It's Jesus. <laughs> Very close by. <laughs> Um, it's the face that everyone takes a photo of. And this was actually after I tried to remove the problem from, from this guy. I decided, okay, I know what the problem was here. I need to only take、uh, one photo per person. So if there's one person that's duplicated a bunch of times, I'm just going to ignore that. I'm only going to take one photo per person. It's going to get rid of a lot of the data, but 
I don't care. I want this to be like as accurate as possible. I'm like pretending to be a machine learning researcher. I'm going to try and like do my best to overcome bias. And I still get this because it doesn't matter. Everyone, regardless of where they're visiting from, wants to take a picture of Jesus. Okay, one last example from this. Uh, you might notice uh, this subregion that's Scandinavia. Um, I was looking at these photos and I thought it's very strange that this person looks slightly purple, like Scandinavian people are not generally purple, to my eyes. <laughs> uh, but it turns out to the machine learning algorithm, they're absolutely purple because everyone in Scandinavia goes to concerts and takes photos. <laughs> and all of the lighting in the concerts has this purple tint to it. Um, anyway, I wanted to give this as an example of like me not like, I don't think of myself as someone who's evil, like trying to, you know, ignore bias, like build something that could potentially be really dangerous. I wanted, I wanted to see what it was like to go through and like train one of these models that could be really dangerous. Like, where do I get tripped up? Like, where's my blind spots as I'm trying to build this? And I just saw it every turn. Like, there's all these things I thought I had some problems solved and it's, not that easy and it makes a really big difference sometimes like treating purple colored people as Scandinavian isn't a huge problem but it's a reminder that there's bias in every data set right even if it's been collected of, from millions of people all over the world um, that they've uploaded data that they've uploaded themselves um, so machine learning is great at imitating examples but the strength of imitation can become a weakness when the input data is already biased right so for example in the United States, there's this automated system that predicts whether a criminal is likely to reoffend once they get released from prison. Um, and it turns out this algorithm is biased against black people because historically, when black people are released from prison, um, they're picked up again very shortly after. Uh, this isn't necessarily because they're actually more likely to reoffend. It's because the entire justice system is sort of bent against them. So this is an imitation from the machine learning algorithm of ongoing systemic failure, and it's affecting real people right now. So I'll leave you with this last challenge. Uh, what's the worst possible application you can imagine of any of these technologies? And I think if we brainstorm a little bit, as kind of all of us creative people in this room, about like the worst direction things can go, it might help clarify like what some of the best directions things can go to. Um, I think that uh, because machine learning as a field moves pretty fast, um, we tend to be reactionary. We see something happen and then we try and respond to it but I think we can do better than that. And if we pick the right questions to have good discussions, then we can be a step ahead. So thank you very much for having me.